We're trying to show you what's going on. Straight up. And it looks like people have wildly different strategies. Some people spend that time being the most And that last I see some of the one thing that we do is we close the words for the you if you imagine the real name, you're but you spend points for every word you use. It's not much of a language, I guess, but no. People are perplexed. Okay. Um, uh, welcome to our, our third talk, our final talk. Uh, Joanna Devani is an assistant professor of music theory and cognition. Um, the common misconception about her is that she plays a musical instrument. She does not, uh, not since high school at least. Um, undergrad. Undergrad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, she will be telling us about her and this way work. Yeah, so the, the usual way it goes is people expect that you have a performance career on your music faculty. I mean, I still can play the piano, I just don't practice it the way I used to. So I just respond usually by saying, no, I spend my time on the computer keyboard. Really so I'm going to talk to you today about um, my work in terms of modeling um, expressive performance using computers. And so the organization of the talk is quite simple. I'm going to tell you why I do what I do. I'm going to tell you how I do what I do. And then I'm going to tell you how I sell, which is a point which has been touched on already. And this whole problem of speaking to different audiences. So I'm going to begin with the why I do what I do. And this is why I needed the audience. So my first musical example is something that you will probably recognize. What's the dream? <laughs> I'm trying to be a professional singer. And why hasn't it worked out so far, Susan? I've not been given the chance before. If you're supposed to get all change. Okay, and who would you like to be as successful as? Elaine Page. Elaine Page. Like what are you going to sing tonight? I'm going to sing I Dream the Dream from the Wizard of Oz. Okay. Big song. Yeah, 
You, why won't it play through the same system that the PowerPoint presentation of Mike Because the USB connection is being moved on that. Oh. <laughs> anyway. Do you want to apply that can, and you can just plug into the wall? Huh? Do you want to? You can just plug into the wall. We tried that. You tried that, yeah. It yeah. sounds like a kid. Yeah, and the one thing with having all these music degrees is I know Neil Drew's But anyway, so that was a MIDI rendition which sounded completely terrible even if you could hear that. So what is going on? Now obviously the reactions that people are having to Susan Boyle have a lot to do with expectations based on her experience, a lot to do with the choice of song that she decided to do in that moment where it's this light song about you know, I had a dream and it wasn't going to be fulfilled, but look, there she is on the stage. And these are all wonderful questions that I don't actually know. What I deal with is what is going on in the difference in the acoustic signal between a really good human rendition of a song and a computer. And this can also, and France is not a big fan of this part of the <laughs> And this can also be looked at in terms of what's the difference between somebody who's just starting to perform and somebody who's got a high level of skill. But essentially it comes down to looking at the actual audio. And so it requires, um, it requires me to look at a few different fields and to use tools from a few different fields in order to study musical performance. So the first is obviously music. And my background, officially, is entirely within music. So I did, you know, my undergraduate degree, started in performance, ended up doing composition for my master's, started a PhD in theory, ended up changing and then doing a PhD in music technology, which is where it stops being strictly about music. But I've always been sitting in a music school, I've always been taking classes with other musicians, and always been like a bit of an odd duck. But in order to do my work, I realized that I did need technology. And specifically, once I realized after I was doing my work in composition and writing all these like complicated things for the performers and wondering, well, what are they actually going to perform, that I needed some way of analyzing that. Although initially my thought was I just needed to research to see what other people had found about that. And I discovered that they actually hadn't found anything particularly consistent. So then I thought, oh, this will be a great PhD project. And that was become the entire career. <laughs> So I needed to get some technology in order to actually understand, you know, in order to actually measure what was going on. So this involves both signal analysis, so this is when I started hanging out with electrical engineers and figuring out how to do signal processing, and also computational modeling once you extract the data. And this is why I start hanging out with people in CS and start learning stuff about statistics. And this is good. You know, once you have some measurement of the audio, you know, you can actually talk about, in some descriptive way, what people are doing. But then it became clear to me that I actually needed to learn and engage with psychology. Because what am I studying, essentially? I'm studying people. And what are these people doing? They are mediating music for other people who are the listeners. And so I needed to learn both about the perceptual aspects of sound in order to be able to inform the way that I was using the technology. So you can get like all kinds of measurements out of an audio signal, but you, if you're doing performance analysis, really want to be able to describe them in a perceptually meaningful way. Some work has been done in this area, some work hasn't been done in this area, and so I spent some of my time running perceptual experiments in order to make sense of what you can extract from the signal analysis. And then the other link comes in with the cognition. And this is something that I haven't done as much work with. But music is a wonderful stimuli um, to use in various cognitive experiments. And then essentially, you know, what I'm aspiring to get after is something that's not some sort of like peripheral perceptual experience. It's much deeper. And so cognition is And so my, you know, kind of like collection of disciplines all attempt to inform each other. But then, of course, I'm left with the problem of being an academic and having to present this to various people and sometimes trying to get funding. How do I sell this to my different audiences? So in order to demonstrate this, I went through some various like 
abstracts and grant proposals and stuff to give you just some examples of how I pitch the same basic idea of why is it interesting to study musical performance to different people. So, starting at home, what do I say to um, other music scholars? And so I might say something like, musicians' performance can convey both the musician's interpretation of the written musical score, as well as emphasize or even manipulate the emotional content of the music through small variations in timing, dynamics, tuning, and timbre. And then what I also like to say to my colleagues, who sometimes may be you know, um, more focused on the score, is that the performances are what the listeners actually hear. And sometimes um, you know, there'll be people doing kind of studies of the listener's perception, and they'll just be using the musical score as an indication of what's going on. But whatever experiment you're running, you're actually having them listen to some performance, and that performer may be manipulating things in some way. I don't know if anybody, um, well, I mean, what I was trying to do with that example early on was to demonstrate you could have the same musical material and have a very different affect. Some of that is going to be in the signal. If I had just played a snippet of the Susan Boyle without any of the context, you would still most likely have a stronger emotional reaction than you would have had even if I played the MIDI in full volume. So the next group that I sometimes talk to are general humanists. And when I talk to humanists, um, and actually sometimes even to my colleagues, as I was doing in a talk the other day, you know, I really need to acknowledge the fact that quantitative analysis is only one part of the game, and that there's a whole you know, world of context which goes into perception. And so I need to engage qualitative analysis. So I might say something like, a combination of quantitative analysis and qualitative methods can be used to address such enduring questions as what constitutes a great performance, or what is unique about a particular performer's style, and how did this develop over the course of their career. Now, moving on to psychologists, I might talk in uh, I might talk about other things such as the listener-centered studies that I was talking about earlier. So saying something like, this work will assist in a range of listener-centered experiments, such as those on cognitive dynamics of musical listening, studies on, how, sorry, studies on how well the performer's intentions are understood by the listeners, and studies on how musical expectations are formed and realized in the listening experience. Other things I might choose to touch on could be that musical performances can be used to be study the effect of uh, training on various parameters, so how well do people learn rhythm over time versus tuning, how much, um, you know, how well do particular approaches work, is there an age difference, all of these developmental questions, or um, looking at um, ensemble performance, that you could actually start to learn something about human interactions and group dynamics, and this could um, be complementary to if you do surveys of people and ask them in a string quartet who's leading, because then you look at the audio and you're like, well, this guy always comes in first. So, there's a range of ways that this can tie in with other studies. And then, of course, I have my technical people. So, if I'm talking to electrical engineers, I might say something like precise descriptions of the musical signal are essential to studying both acoustical and interpretive aspects of musical performance. MIDI audio alignment is a useful tool for identifying note boundaries, i.e. onsets and offsets. This information can be used directly for timing-based studies and it's also important for pitch-based research in the absence of robust transcription methods. And here, you notice I start to use particular types of vocabulary that you pull in, which is essential when you're talking to your audience. You can essentially be talking about very small ideas, but there's certain keywords that you need to hone in on so that they actually feel that like you're speaking your language. And finally, um, amongst the academics, I have you know, my kind of computer science spiel, which is the technologies developed in this project will advance the state of the art for music alignment and extraction of pitch and loudness data from polyphonic audio. More generally, this research has the potential to benefit the field of machine learning, since the analysis of music audio is a particularly difficult temporal task that necessi necessitates the development of sophisticated models. So here I might also tie into work that's being done in language, because it's also a temporal hierarchical model. And certainly I do steal an awful lot of what's been used in language because language has a lot more funding and so developed a lot more stuff. And then the final group that I might speak to on occasion is the general public. And to them, I take a completely different tack. 
So if somebody says, what do you do? I ask them, are you familiar with autotune? And the conversation usually goes something like this. Yeah? It kind of sucks, right? Yeah? Well, my research can help make it a lot better. And I focus on intonation and the singing voice mostly. Cool! So that is the end of my uh, little spiel, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, so when did you start trying to find out?